Uh, I wanted to comment a little bit about um, five verses in Surah Al-Shu'ara. Surah Al-Shu'ara uh, deals with many different prophets. And the verse uh, I chose is one of the ones we recite a lot in the Salah. It's the one that Ibrahim alayhi salam is dialoguing with his people. And uh, he says that all of these gods that you worship, I have nothing to do with them except I want to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the famous five verses, الَّذِي خَلَقَنِي فَهُوَ يَهْدِينَ وَالَّذِي يُطْعِمُنِي وَيَسْقِينَ وَإِذَا مَرِطُ فَهُوَ يَشْفِينَ وَالَّذِي يُمِيتُنِي ثُمَّ يُحِينَ وَالَّذِي أَطْمَعُ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ لِي خَطِيئَةِ يَوْمَ الدِّينَ So inshallah, let's talk a little bit about these five beautiful verses in Surah Al-Shu'ara. You can look them up for uh, the context. Uh, wanted to just start off by stating that Ibrahim alayhi salam at this stage is a young teenager. And scholars have differed when did the Risala or the Wahi begin. But it is very likely when this conversation is taking place, he is not yet a prophet. So he is engaging in this conversation and Jibreel has not yet visited him. He does not have direct connection through Jibreel with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is speaking as a thinking, rational young child opposing his entire community. And this is why the story of Ibrahim is so interesting because we get a vision of what a pure and courageous soul is like in a land of complete idolatry, in a land where monotheism was non-existent. A young child comes up and he never worships these false gods. Later on, he's going to physically destroy the gods, as you know the story right now. But this incident is taking place before that you know, incident. So right now, he is still debating with his people. And one wonders, how did he come to monotheism when nobody is preaching monotheism? How did he know idolatry is wrong and there is one God? How does he know this when Jibreel has not yet visited him, when nobody is preaching this? And these verses give us the answer. And this is the Islamic methodology. And I want us to memorize it and implement it when we speak to other people that are outside our faith. This is the Abrahamic methodology. In contrast to the Western methodology, the philosophical methodology, which is radically different than our methodology. So what does Ibrahim alayhi salam say? I am an enemy to all of these false gods, except for the one true God. الَّذِي خَلَقَنِي فَهُوَ يَهْدِينِي He is the one who created me, so I know he must guide me. This summarizes the Abrahamic aqidah. He created me, how could he leave me without any guidance? Now, Western philosophy is obsessed with the first part of it, خَلَقَنِي. And Islamic theology is more interested in the second part, يَهْدِينِي. Hidayah. Western philosophy from the beginning, from Aristotle, it is obsessed with the question, how do I know a God exists? It has always been troubling their minds. And that's why, because they could not answer this question according to their own methodology, agnosticism and atheism has spread. It's not an Eastern problem, it is a Western problem. Because they're the ones who made it a problem. And in our religion, in our aqidah, the fact that خلقني, خلاص, He created me. I am a created being. I know this. Because I'm created, there must be a creator. The Quranic methodology of proving there is a khaliq is to simply open your eyes and look. You don't need complicated philosophical maxims and evidences. You don't need PhDs and dissertations. The most obvious of all things that are obvious is that there's a creator. And that's why Allah is saying, haven't they looked around them? Don't they look at the creation of the heaven and earth? Don't they look at the camel? Don't they look at the sun? Don't they look at the moon? You just have to see and you know that there is a khaliq, a mudabbir, a fatir. You know that there is somebody who is a rabb, who is taking care of all of this. When this world exists in this beautiful manner, there must be a rabb. Because there's a rabb and because this creation exists, I know he's not going to leave me alone. I know that there's a guidance and a hidayah. So what is that hidayah? Let me find it. This is the Abrahamic mindset. This is the mindset of the one who is upon the pure fitrah. 
As for the other methodology, it's constantly getting involved in questions that are self-evident. When you complicate that which is simple, you're going to fall into problems, right? That which is simple, that which is self-evident, when you complicate it, right? When you make it difficult, well then, you're going to raise your own, you know, problems. Just like the Bani Israel, what type of cow, what's the this, that? Yeah, it's obvious, just do it, right? But when you overcomplicate, you dig yourself into a hole. And this is what, frankly, was Eastern philosophy has done from the beginning of time. The Eastern understanding, the, I should say the Abrahamic understanding, is that we don't need to prove Allah's existence. Now somebody will say, hold on a sec, didn't Ibrahim السلام, himself prove Allah's existence by looking at the sun, the moon, the stars? And this is a very important uh, uh, paragraph or a subset of the talk here. Yes, we know in, in the Quran, Ibrahim السلام, is having another debate with his people, right? When the night came, he saw a star. He said, this is my Rabb. When it disappeared, he said, I don't like that which, you know, disappears. When he saw the big moon, he said, this is my Rabbi. When it disappeared, he goes, no, this can't be it either, right? This is the biggest of them. This must be my Lord, right? Then when it disappeared, he goes, none of these. I must, uh, Now, somebody will say, isn't he searching for God's existence? We say this is a very, very dangerous and incorrect interpretation of this passage. This is not the meaning of this passage. Sometimes, unfortunately, we are, our children are taught this in Sunday school, that we, we say, oh, Ibrahim السلام, was searching for the truth and he examined the stars. SubhanAllah, this understanding is not coming from our ulama. It is actually coming from the philosopher. It is coming from the philosophers of Islam. Our ulama completely rejected and negated this understanding. And there are many evidences. Ibn Taymiyyah actually has like 10 pages of discussion on this. It's a very dangerous point. Do you realize what you're saying when you say that Ibrahim says, that is my Rabb? Do you realize what you're saying? That Ibrahim is a... Astaghfirullah, yani mushrik and kafir and pagan. And Allah says multiple times, وَمَا كَانَ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ وَلَمْ يَكُنْ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ إِنَّ أَبْرَيْكَ كَانَ أُمَّةً حَنِيفًا قَائِمًا لِلَّهِ So Ibrahim is praised multiple times. He was never mushrik. He was never pagan. He's always turning towards Allah. And then somebody comes and says, oh, he thought the sun is his God. He thought the moon is his God. He thought the sun is his, you know, God. The response is, as Ibn Taymiyyah says, إن إبراهيم كان مناظرا ولم يكن ناظرا. That Ibrahim alayhi salam was using these questions to debate, and he was not using them to search for the truth. You see, when you debate somebody, right? Sometimes you take on his premise to show how illogical it is. Okay? When you're debating somebody, say, okay, خلاص, if this is true, then what will happen? And then you show it's not true. Then you go back and you continue doing it. In this conversation. We as Muslims, I should say as mainstream Orthodox Muslims, because obviously the philosopher, the philosopher, you know the group, the philosopher, right? Yani Ibn Sina type and all that. Right? They have a different understanding of Islam. Where, yani, we disagree with them. Let's leave it at that for now, today, right now. Point is, their interpretation is that Ibrahim was a philosoph. And Ibrahim is examining and extracting. He doesn't know there's a God. He's a, you know, agnostic and he has to prove there's a God. So let me take one false God. Okay, not this one. Then the other false God. Then when all of them are negated, then I will choose the correct God. No, that's not the way. Actually, that's why in the end of this, uh, see, in the end of this section, Ibrahim explicitly says that I have rejected all of this. Inni wajjahtu wajhiya lilladhi fatara samawati wa radha hanifan. I'm going to turn my face and head to the one who created the heavens. Look, he says created the heavens. So, point is, we have to not misunderstand this section. Ibrahim never doubted Allah. Uh, Ibrahim never doubted Allah. Ibrahim is never becoming a philosopher, a, 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 a philosopher proving Allah's existence. This passage is a debate. It is not personal reflection. Is that clear? Right? He's debating his people. So, my Lord created me. End of story. You don't need more evidences. I am created. There must, there must be a creator. We are more interested in the second bit. 
There is a creator. I must therefore have hidayah from that creator. And I know Allah is going to give me that hidayah. That yaqeen that Ibrahim had was so strong, it essentially caused him to become a prophet eventually, right? He's so certain Allah is going to give me guidance. I don't know what it is now, just like the process of Ghari Hira. I don't know what it is. I don't know the exact way to worship Allah, but I know this way is wrong here. The same understanding, that purity of the fitrah, purity of the intellect and the soul. You know something is wrong, you just don't know the 100% right answer. You, you have in the right direction. That's what Ibrahim is saying. He knows there's one God. The Prophet knows there's one God, but he doesn't know the details of how to worship Allah, the details of the theology. You didn't know what is kitab, you didn't know what is iman until we revealed it to you. So, Ibrahim alayhi's yaqeen was so strong, eventually Allah sent Jibreel down and made him a prophet. You, I know Allah is going to guide me. This also, by the way, demonstrates another Islamic key principle, which again is in contradistinction to many understandings of uh, you know, modern uh, Western philosophy. The one who created us is going to be the one who tells us how to live our lives. There is now a very common trend, spiritual but not religious. This is very common in the millennial generation. That if you ask them, is there a God? You know, not the way you guys think. There's an energy, there's a force, there's cosmic, there's karma, this and that. You know, they name these things. Because deep down inside, they know there must be something. So they call it spiritual. There must be some energy, some higher power. But I don't believe in organized religion. Okay, this is actually, in some most European countries, this philosophy is more than Christianity. In America, we are still a Christian nation, so Christianity is more. In most European countries, there are more people who say, I believe in something, but not your God, spiritual, but not religious, right? Then there are people who say, I am Christians. The world is changing now. This simple verse refutes that entire understanding. How can there be a higher power and he doesn't interact with you. He doesn't care about you. He doesn't tell you how to live your life. And this is why, again, Allah says in the Quran uh, that, um, insanu an yutraka suda. Did man think that he would be left in randomness and chaos? Did man think we would create him and then let him be? That doesn't make any sense. What type of God is this? What type of Fatir? What type of Rabb? What type of Khaliq? How can you create this beautiful creation and then let it be and walk away and have nothing to do with it? So Ibrahim alayhi salam, his fitra knew. The fact that I am here means there's a God and the fact there's a God knows he's going to guide me. Then why should I worship this God? He's providing for me my food, my drink. Every day I wake up and I don't know where it's going to come from. Lo and behold, it is there. There is a Rabb that is actively involved. When I fall sick, then he cures me. Our scholars point out, Ibrahim alayhi salam is already speaking in a manner befitting of Allah. When I fall sick, he cures me. He ascribes the sickness to himself and the cure to Allah. Even though in the grand scale of things, everything comes from Allah. But when you speak about disasters, calamities, when you speak about something which is negative, you try your best to remove its ascription to Allah. When I fall sick, even though the sickness in the grand scale of things comes from Allah, you ascribe it to yourself, I fell sick. Then you ascribe the cure to Allah, He cures me. This shows us the adab. Now again, technically it is not wrong. Of course it is a matter of aqidah. Everything happens by the will of Allah Azza wa But when we speak, Especially when we dialogue in the maqam of da'wah, we have to be especially, how are we talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And that's why in the story of Khidr and Musa, the same thing happens, right? When he drowns the ship, فَأَرَدْتُ أَنْ أَعِيبَهَا I wanted to poke the hole in the ship. And when the child is, you know, going to be replaced and whatnot, فَأَرَادَ رَبُّكَ أَنْ يَبْلُغَ أَشُدَّهُمَا Sorry, when the wall and the, the, the orphans are, are, are kept there with the wall, right? فَأَرَادَ رَبُّكَ أَنْ يَبْلُغَ أَشُدَّهُمَا Your Lord wanted the two orphans to grow up. Notice, I caused the hole in the ship. Your Lord wanted to protect the orphans. Notice how he changes the khitab, the dialogue, right? 
And that's why even our Prophet he, ta- he taught us, وَالشَّرُّ لَيْسَ إِلَيْكَ We do not ascribe evil to you, O Allah. In our khitab, in our talks, we do not ascribe evil to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We try our best to have adab with Allah. وَإِذَا مَرِضْتُ فَهُوَ يَشْفِينَ وَالَّذِي يُمِيتُنِي ثُمَّ يُحْيِينَ Subhanallah, Ibrahim alayhi salam already understood there must be a cycle of life here. This life cannot just finish with death. It doesn't make sense that this life finishes with death. So the one who created me, he is going to be the one that's going to cause me to die and then be resurrected again. In these five verses, Tawheed, Risala, Akhira are all mentioned, subhanAllah. The purity of Ibrahim's aql. In these simple verses, there must be a God. That God is guiding me. That's Risala. There's going to be a heaven and hell and day of judgment. Because the fitra says this world cannot be meaningless. There must be something bigger. There must be something better. Therefore, the one who created me, the one who guided me, is the one who caused me to die. And he will bring me back to life. And therefore, if that is the characteristic of this God, if this is how the Lord is, then I'm confident that my Lord is merciful and tender and kind. My Lord is not an evil Lord. He's not a sadistic Lord. He's not Lord or Lord of punishment. When this world exists and there's so much beauty in it, so much rahmah, I am confident that when He resurrects me, inshallah, hopefully, I am, I am optimistic that He will forgive all of my sins. Notice how good his perception is of Allah, right? Husn al-dhan in Allah Azza wa Jal. That the Lord that I have is a merciful Lord, a kareem Lord, a ghafoor Lord. And this is why Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he raised to this ranks, Allah Azza wa Jal caused, as we know, when he was thrown to the fire, Jibreel to come down. Most scholars say that is when his nubuwa and risala began, when he was thrown into the fire of Nimrud. Most scholars say, which means this entire conversation is coming straight from the pure fitra and soul. There's no direct communication with Allah. In any case, some benefits, inshallah, from these verses. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to take Ibrahim and the Prophet as a role model. May Allah azza wa jalla allow us to walk in their paths and have that spirit of their iman and ikhlas and tawakkul and yaqeel. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> أما استحييته تعصيني ولا تخشى من العتب وتخفي الذنب عن خلقي وتأبى في الهوى قربي فتب مما جنيت عسى تعود إلى رضا الرحيم